Welcome, everyone. We are going to have a very interesting episode as I get to discuss physical activity and healthy aging with the very expert of the team. Our guest is working as a professor of applied health sciences and as a dean of the graduate college at the University of Illinois, US. He is the principal investigator for a series of projects charged with the developing a national strategy for promoting healthy aging in the USA, and his publication, ACMS Position Stand, Exercise and Physical Activity for Older Adults, has been cited over 4,000 times. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest, Professor Wojtek Hotsko-Chaiko. Welcome. Well, it's good to be here, Oli. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Did I go even close to pronouncing your name name correctly. Yeah, you you were perfect with Wojtek and most people don't try my last name but it's Hodzko Zajko. It's yeah. a Polish name. Yeah. It's a it's a challenging for us. Maybe for Finns a little bit easier than for Americans. Yeah. So should we should we start would you like to give a broad overview of your 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 research work? Yeah. So Really, for the whole of my career, I've been interested in trying to understand how physical activity and healthy lifestyles influence the aging process. And, you know, as a young assistant professor, I was very interested in studying clinical depression. And I noted that physical activity seemed to have antidepressant effects. And so I was very interested in measuring physical fitness, um, exercise capacity in older individuals. And I, I began to notice that we really didn't have good measures of physical fitness that we could apply in all older people. So at that time, most of the work involving older adults had been done in very healthy people who were regularly exercising and who were athletes. And we really didn't know how to measure physical capacity in people who were frail and older and maybe didn't do any physical activity. And so gradually my interest began to switch over to trying to understand the interaction between exercise and the aging process. And over the years, I've really expanded my work, not just focusing on exercise, but on all types of physical activity. So that's kind of how I started. And then about, oh, maybe 20 or 25 years ago, I began to be more interested in trying to understand how national and international policy could be developed to help make a difference at the population level. In other words, to to think about how to advocate for healthy lifestyle choices and in particular physical activity at the national and international level. And so I started doing some work with the World Health Organization, establishing guidelines for physical activity. And for many years in the United States, I helped uh, develop our own national strategy for promoting physical activity in the midlife and older population. So generally, my work has tended to focus on the 50 plus population. Mm. And and you mentioned that we didn't have a good good methods of measuring fitness of older adults. Could you could you elaborate a little bit more? What were the problems with the testing methods we had and how those have been been overcome? Yeah, well, I think the challenge is that if you think of a um, a measure of cardiovascular fitness, such as, for example, maximal oxygen consumption, VO2 max, in general, those are collected in exercise stress tests, either to maximal exertion or to near maximal exertion. And, you know, in the 70s, it was really difficult for a researcher to take an 80-year-old 
sedentary female and put them on a treadmill or a bicycle ergometer and expect them to exercise to exhaustion so that we could collect these data. And so what tended to happen is because of our concern for the safety of participants and because of human subjects protocols, most of the research done with older people was on a very selected group of uh, older people who were already very healthy and very active. So we didn't really understand how your physical health impacted the aging process from a, a an exercise perspective in the whole population, only in a very select subgroup. And I think gradually over time, we learned to develop additional measures that uh, perhaps could estimate fitness without using maximal tests. And also, we began to understand that uh, perhaps you can collect some data more safely than we worried about when we first started in this research area. Mm. So moving away from maximal test to submaximal test, maybe losing a little bit of accuracy, but making it much more easier and safe to do them. Well, you know, I, I don't want to give the impression that most of the work in this area is based upon the testing of individual older people. I would say the 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 real strength of our understanding of the relationship between physical activity and health has come from epidemiological studies where we are studying very large numbers of people and we're looking at their life histories their health histories their uh, physical activity levels uh, as reported uh, by questionnaire or by accelerometer and then determining a relationship between chronic disease and physical activity participation. Mm, yeah. And so so basically you have been a principal investigation for this project, developing a national strategy for promoting healthy aging in the US. It's it's quite a big task. And how do you how do you approach something like that? What's the philosophy behind what do we want to mean with the healthy aging you can define health in many ways do we try to find things that are, have the biggest impact or the ones which are easiest to achieve could you tell a little bit about the approach behind there when starting this kind of work you know my sense is that there really have been five critical milestones in the work that attempts to establish a relationship between physical activity and successful aging. And the first two, I think, have been established, but the last three are still in progress. So the first one was building the evidence base. And that was simply doing the studies that established that regular physical activity, uh, oftentimes exercise, but not always, So, for example, people who have very active jobs, such as farmers or people who work in physical labor, don't necessarily have to exercise to get the benefits of physical activity. But the early studies were needed to establish the relationship between physical activity and uh, differential rates of aging, both physiologically and psychologically. And I think that evidence is now very, very strong. The second phase was seeking consensus among professionals. That means having physicians and other health professionals understand that prescribing physical activity as part of a healthy lifestyle was a really important step in their role as the health advisor for their patients. And I think for a number of years, you saw debate among physicians and other medical professionals. Well, should we be doing this? Is the evidence strong enough? But now I think uh, it is unanimous among health professionals that physical activity is extremely important, along with uh, good appropriate nutrition as part of a healthy lifestyle prescription. So 
what are the three phases that are still underway? Uh, the first, the, the third one is educating the public and building consumer demand. Okay. So in all of our countries, the proportion of people who are physically active is not what we would like it to be. Um, of course, there are differences between countries, but there are too many sedentary people, too many people who are overweight and deconditioned in every country. And perhaps just as important, the older the population gets, the higher the levels of physical inactivity. And so in one sense, a public information campaign is needed to educate the public and to empower them to make physically active choices all the way through their entire lifestyle. Phase four is developing a public policy framework. So it's not sufficient to talk just simply to individuals, but you need to develop a policy and an environment that enables people to be physically active. And sometimes that occurs at the municipal level, sometimes it occurs at the national level, sometimes it occurs at the international level, but there's a need for governments to come together and say, how are we going to implement policy that will help prevent chronic disease by giving people opportunities to be more physically active? And then phase five is refining, expanding, and evolving the model. And to me, that really means that we're living in a complicated world. And it's not simple enough to say, oh, well, we need to make sure that there are exercise programs available in all retirement communities. Uh, because successful aging is not only about physical activity. It's about nutrition, it's about security, it's about uh, finances, it's about transportation. And in recent years, uh, national governments and organizations like the WHO have focused a lot of attention on, for example, healthy city projects. So what do we need to do with regard to urban planning? What do we need to do with regard to schools with regard to zoning requirements in such a way that we build a community that has the opportunity to be more physically active and more healthy. Um, another example of refining the model would be, for example, trying to prevent uh, falls in older people. So, you know, falls, falling can be catastrophic in the older adult population. And sometimes that is related to um, deconditioning and loss of muscle strength, where a physical activity exercise program could be useful. But other times it could be related to sensory uh, loss associated with aging, vision, or vestibular, vestibular function. Other times it could be related to uh, polypharmacy and the interaction of different medications. And so, understanding that physical activity is a part of healthy aging, but it is not the only thing that needs to be done. So when I was working with the national strategy in the US, we basically had 50 major organizations that came together and kind of asked the question, what is it that we need to do in order to advance those last three strategies. So educating the public, developing policy to promote healthy lifestyles and recognizing that we need to be, um, how shall I put it, collaborative and cross-disciplinary in our approaches. And I think now in most countries, there are coalitions between uh, government organizations, NGOs, industry coming together to see if they can identify their joint needs for promoting physical activity. Mm. 
Yeah, interesting. So five five points, and we have the evidence base, we have the consensus, but then to actually get it implemented, what do you see as the most important parts in the implementation? You said that there is municipality level and so on. Do we understand enough how how people work? How do they change behavior? What motivates them? How do we how do we enable it? Or do you think we need more research on the understanding individuals, but also also cultures and how how people be? Yeah. Them? yeah. Well, you know, I'm a scientist. I work at a university. You're asking me if we need more research. Of course we need more research. There there are many, many questions that remain unanswered and really in all phases of this. So um, trying to understand the rate at which people deteriorate when they get older and the impact of various lifestyles on that rate of deterioration trying to understand why people have so much difficulty in choosing to be physically active, understanding what it is that a a municipality or a national government can do to provide more opportunities and help people with some of those behavioral choices. All of those things are critically important. And, you know, if you ask me what the most important thing is, I think it's empowering people to find a way to include physical activity into their everyday lives. That's it's 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 as simple simple and as complicated as that. And you know, if you and your listeners wouldn't mind, I'd, I'd love to tell you a little story about my mother and her own uh, struggles with becoming physically active. Please. So. My my mom is a is a Polish lady living in London, and she had a, a, a very interesting story. For ten years, she was uh, um, as a child in the labor camps, the gulags in Siberia, growing up in in a extraordinarily difficult uh, time. Uh, but she settled in London, and. I, by that time, was an assistant professor establishing a name for myself in physical activity and aging. And one day, she called me up. She was probably, at that time, about 65 years old. She was still working as a teacher. And she said, Wojtek, you've got to help me. I said, well, what is it you want, Mom? And she said, I know I'm supposed to do 30 minutes of physical activity three times a week. That was what the current guidelines were then. Okay, now it's uh, 150 minutes and try to do it five or six times a week. But that time we were telling people 30 minutes three times a week. And she said, Wojtek, I can't do it. When I get home from school, I am just too tired. There's no way I'm going to be able to do this. So I said to her, I said, Mama, will you do me a favor? And she said, yes. I said, well, when you get home from school, before you take your coat off, I want you to ask yourself a single question. Am I too tired to walk to the shops at the top of the street? So there were some shops maybe 100 meters from her house. And I said, if the answer is yes, I'm too tired, then just take your coat off, make a cup of tea and relax. I said, but if you're not too tired, what I want you to do is walk to the shops, come back and just put a little check mark on your calendar on the wall for that day. That's all I want you to do. And I said, I'll call you back in a couple of weeks and it would be great if you could have three check marks, right? And so then... I call in a couple of weeks and the first words out of her mouth was, I had four check marks in the first week and five this week. I said, that's great, mom. Keep putting the check marks on. I didn't say anything else. About a month later, we had another phone call and I said, mama, are you ready for another question? She said, okay. I said, well, 
when you get to the shops, I want you to ask yourself, do I want to go straight home or can I walk around the block? I said, if you if the, if say you want to go home, go home. But if not, go around the block. And, you know, for the next 25 years, she was able to be regularly physically active. Now, for me as a scientist, it's interesting to analyze that situation and what was different. Well, first of all, our approach to exercise prescription was not very sophisticated at that point in time. We told people 30 minutes. And the, what they heard was, if I don't do 30 minutes, it's no good. And for her, where she was at that point in time, 30 minutes was kind of like climbing Mount Everest, right? She knew she couldn't do it. So my goal was to offer her something that she knew she could do because she goes to those shops often. And so that, that's related to what psychologists call self-efficacy. So you offer, a, if you like, an exercise invitation that the person feels very comfortable that they can do and that they will not fail. Now, the second thing we did was a ask her to make a behavioral notification of that success by putting a check mark on the calendar. And the third thing we did was slowly build up to the prescribed exercise prescription. And, you know, it's not that I'm some kind of a great exercise counselor. I mean, people have known these motivational strategies for a very, very long time. They're clearly evidence-based. And, you know, very, very many personal trainers, health counselors use those strategies every single day. I think the challenge has been to make sure that when we communicate our um, public information messaging, we recognize that people are in different places in their lives. They have different things that they like to do. And we should empower people to be physically active, but to do that in their own way and at their own pace, because ultimately the goal is to, to change their behavior. And, you know, I, I remember uh, there was a, a, a Finnish scientist, Eno Heikkinen, who was a famous, famous scientist in the area of physical activity and aging. And I was at a, a I was chairing a world congress on uh, aging and physical activity, and he was giving one of the keynote speeches. And at the end of his speech, there was question time. And one of the members of the audience said, Professor Heikkinen, what do you consider to be the best form of physical activity? And he, his response was, any physical activity that you will do. And then he said, for me, I would buy a dog. And I thought that it was such a, uh, such a wise response because I think what the questioner was looking for was some discussion as to, well, is it better to use a treadmill or a bicycle or gometer or how much resistance versus how much uh, aerobic activity? And his response was very clearly the most important thing was to promote physically active choices that people are willing to stick to. And that's the critical important component, you know. Um, as I reflect over my, my life course, you know, I have been what most people would call a, a, a crazy exerciser for my whole life. And for me, there's never been a question about being physical, physically active. For me, the challenge is not to do too much. But 
people like us are unusual and unrepresentative of the population at large. And I think we have to change our mentality to think like the person who struggles with behavior change, with, like the person who would rather sit on the couch and watch TV as opposed to getting outside and doing cross-country skiing or whatever it is that they want to do. And so I think showing empathy and above all flexibility, you know, and, you know, sometimes people say to me, let's say I travel a lot to give speeches and I'm in China and I see people doing, older people doing Qigong and Tai Chi in the park in the morning. And people will then say, well, but is that really enough physical activity? I mean, they are not. Uh, reaching a target heart rate or they are not uh, getting sufficient uh, aerobic benefit. And I reflect on some of the research data um, uh, conducted by my friend and colleague Stephen Blair uh, in the uh, Aerobics uh, uh, Institute study in the Cooper Clinic in Texas. They studied uh, epidemiologically uh, men for many years, and they divided the population into physical activity quartiles, the most active, the least active, and the two groups in the middle. And if you look at the benefits for uh, mortality and morbidity, the biggest benefit is getting out of that lowest quartile into the next one. And you know, getting into the second quartile is not gonna make the senior Olympic team. It's not necessarily high levels of physical activity. It's recognizing that moving from a completely sedentary status to the next group may be the most significant health benefit. Now, I'm not suggesting for one second that you shouldn't try to get across into the most active quartile. Absolutely, of course you should. But I think that from a public policy perspective, figuring out ways to help people uh, get out of the rocking chair and off the couch may be the most significant uh, public policy goal that we have.